Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to all of you. It's good to see you here this morning. It's good to be back with you. Uh, this past week, I was down in uh, Tui Ridge uh, helping out with teen camp, and it was a blast. Got to work with about 60 young people there, and uh, yeah, really to see the, the Spirit of God moving among them, and uh, yeah, to just have a lot of fun with them. We had a blast uh, chasing around, doing activities, you know, playing basketball at 10 o'clock at night with them, and having a great time. I uh, feel like I need a holiday after that, though. It was a long week. Kids have a lot of energy, and I thought I was young, but uh, yeah, they can sure go. You know, it was, um, it was interesting in the time while I was there. When we come together, I think the devil likes to work hard to bring distraction and to, to, to try to create chaos so that, yeah, it kind of lessens the power or, or the environment um, in which God is trying to work. Because in that week, one of our young persons there, their, um, their uncle passed away. And that's tragic, you know, trying to be away to have a good time with your friends and you're dealing with this heartache at home. And then another individual, their, uh, their cousins passed away, a husband and wife, leaving behind two children. And that's quite tragic. And then another man, it's like the young man, 18 years old, and his uh, best friend at home committed suicide. You know, it, it was just really tragic uh, just to see this. Because I think God was really trying to pour His Spirit out, but I think the devil was trying to bring some really big heartache and tragedy to, to bring distraction. But nevertheless, we are here, and we are one day closer to seeing Jesus come. And uh, we can look forward to that. But there'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. These former things have passed away. So just as we get into our Bible study this morning, I just want to offer up one more word of prayer. So if you will, just bow your heads with me. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that your, your Spirit may just come here and, and speak to us. Lord, teach us new things. May we come away having spent this time with you. May we just yeah, feel and, and, and uh, hear something new of you today. And um, Lord, I ask that, Lord, that you will speak through me. Um, help me to say the words that you would have me to say. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it working? Not sure. I'll just try and stay in front of here. It's almost time for the Lord to come. Do you feel like it is? Do you feel like Christ is nearer this week than he was last week, his second coming? Do you have a greater burden in your heart for your Lord to come this week than you did last week? I believe so. You know, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus tells a parable there of some group of people that are waiting for the second coming of Jesus. Now he tells this story right after he gives the signs of the times discussed in Matthew chapter 24. And we read about them in our teen Sabbath school this morning. The signs of earthquakes, wars, famines in various places and pestilence and so forth. False Christs and false prophets. He's put these signs in place to let us know not the day or the hour, but to give us a gauge to know that his coming is soon, that it's, that it's near, that it's at the door. And then he tells a story of a group of people in Matthew 25 that are waiting. Five wise virgins and five foolish. And they all fall asleep. But it's only those that had extra oil in their lamps that were ready to, to welcome the bridegroom. That were ready to welcome Christ's second coming. And in verse 13 of that story, Jesus says, Watch therefore... For you know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Stay alert. I'm coming soon. You don't know the day or the hour. That doesn't mean go take a nap, but be vigilant. Be alert. And what does it mean to watch? Does it mean that we just simply, you know, sit at home on our, on our televisions and we get out our favorite potato chips, by the way, in maybe six months we might not have too many here in New Zealand. I hear the potato shortage is, is, is coming. Do we sit at home and we turn on CNN 
and we just simply watch and just wait, oh, and check off the list from Matthew chapter 24. Yep, there's another sign. Yep, there's another sign. Jesus is coming soon. Is this what it means to watch and to be ready for the second coming of Jesus? You know, Jesus doesn't just leave us hanging, but he carries on the story with another story in Matthew chapter 25. And he tells us what it means to watch for the second coming of Jesus. Matthew 25 and verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to each according to his own ability, and immediately went on his journey. Each of these servants received something. Each received a talent. Now, I know Pastor Adrian, a few weeks ago, presented this message. And he said there was a dual application to this parable. He says, yes, actually, God is actually calling us to be responsible with our means, with our money, to be wise stewards of that, that God is calling us to be faithful with the funds that he gives us. But he also said there was another application, that these talents also represent the God-given abilities that each one of us possesses, our talents, our skills, that are unique to each one of us, but that are a gift from God that you possess. And I believe God is calling us to be responsible with these gifts. And this is how he tells us that we are to watch, is that we are to use these gifts in hastening and preparing for the second coming of Jesus. Now, the only point I want to draw necessarily from this parable right now is that, one, each of us possesses something, possesses some gift, some skill that God has given you. And you might say, no, not me. <laughs> God, God hasn't given me a specific skill. But according to the parable, everyone received something. Some received more than others, but each received something. And you know the story in the parable that it doesn't actually matter on how many that you receive, but the second point I want to draw from this is it matters what we do with it. Amen? That whatever skill or whatever gift God gives us, no matter how many or how few they are, it matters only what we do with it. And there was the one that received five talents, that he improved those five talents, and he made another five. And those that received two, he improved those two, and he made another two. But the one that received one, he thought, oh, I only got one talent. I only got this one measly little talent. So when he dug a hole and he buried it. And when the Lord came back, he says, here it is. You can have it back now. I've kept it for you. And God says, no, that's not what I wanted. I wanted you to use it. So God, I believe, is calling us to use our God-given skills and abilities for his glory and honor. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see some of these Talents, these abilities, these skills that are listed here. Spiritual gifts, if you will. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and in verse 7, it says, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, For the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Why? It says, for the profit of all. The gifts that are endowed upon us by the Spirit of God, they are not given so that we can harbor it to ourselves and hold it to ourselves, but they are given so that we can bless other people. It says in verse 8, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another uh, the gifts of healings by the same Spirit, and to another the workings of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another discerning of spirits, to another, another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Parable in Matthew chapter 25, it says that each servant received something. You know what your gift is. Now, you may be afraid to acknowledge it. You may be afraid to step out and actually use it. But God has given everyone some ability, 
some skill to use for the glory of God. Have any of you ever heard of the man by the name of Nick Vojkovic? Did I say that right? This Nick Vojkovic, I believe that's how you say his name, is he has no arms and he has no legs. Is this sounding a little more familiar? Now, Nick, he could probably sit at home thinking, man, I'm useless. God can't use me. But you know what? He gave his heart to the Lord at a young age. And God uses Nick in a very powerful way. He actually travels the world using his mouth, because that's all he really has. And he speaks, and he presents to young people, to old people, encouraging them to have faith in Jesus Christ. That no matter how dark their situation is, no matter how helpless their outlook may be, they can still have faith in God, and God will see them through. And he says, look at me. He says, I got no arms, I got no legs, no problem. I got God. So it doesn't matter. We all have received something, some gifts, some ability. And I believe God is calling us to use that, to use it to reach someone else. Hey, you might say, I'm just a farmer, or I'm just a cook, or I'm just a stay-at-home mom, or I'm just a laborer. I might just drive a machine. But either way, God has given you some skill, some ability, and some specific field to use that skill to reach someone for Jesus Christ. Now, with that in mind, I want you to turn with me to a story found in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 3, where we find a story of a simple shepherd, that God turns his life around and he calls him to do something great. And in Exodus chapter 3, we come to this guy by the name of Moses. Now, he's out tending his flocks in the land of Midian, and he sees over on the hillside, he sees a bush, and it's burning but well, there's something strange about this bush because it's not actually being consumed. It's on fire, but it's not burning up. Something strange. And he says, I need to go aside and, and see this strange sight. But in the midst of this burning and fiery bush is God. And he calls out to Moses. He says, I got a work for you to do. And in chapter 3 of Exodus, and in verse 16, God says to Moses, Go. And gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and have seen what is done in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and to the Hittites and to the Amorites and to the Pezer Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now this is the land, it says, to a land flowing with milk and honey. What a ginormous task this was for Moses. God says, hey, I need you to go and call the children of Israel. By the way, they are enslaved in Egypt and say, hey, come and follow me. I'm going to take you to a land that I will show you, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Does that sound like an easy task? A group of people that is probably well over a million people that, by the way, again, are enslaved. He says, call them out of their slavery into a land that I will show you. Do you think you might have some excuses and reasons why maybe it can't be done? Would you have some personal ideas of reason why you particularly could not engage in this activity for God? I think I could think of a few excuses. And so does Moses. <laughs> In, Mo in uh, Exodus chapter 4, I almost said Moses chapter 4. You know, in Europe, um, I have friends over there from Switzerland, and they don't have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They have Moses 1, Moses 2, Moses 3, Moses 4, Moses 5. Did you know that? Because they call Genesis, Moses 1, Exodus, Moses 2. reason why is because Moses had written uh, all five of these books. So yes, we're in Moses 2, chapter 4. Moses 2, chapter 4, the Bible says, verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me, believe me or listen to my voice, and suppose they will say, The Lord has not appeared to you. That's a pretty good excuse. You're just a shepherd. You've been out in the land of Midian. You're out of touch with the reality. How do we know you are sent by God? It's a good excuse. What does God say to Moses? Verse 2. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? 
And he says, a rod. What is that in your hand? A rod. Moses is holding a shepherd's rod in his hand. And what was a shepherd's rod used for? For herding sheep, right? Now, there's a lot of variety of tasks and uses and value for that shepherd's rod. Is that you can use it to, when you're tired, you might lean upon it, you know? Or to steady yourself going over across rocky, rocky terrain or up a, uh, up a steep hillside. It might be a, a good anchor point. But also, in the shepherd's rod, they have a crook usually on the end of it. You know the kind of rods that I'm speaking of? Is that they'll use that rod to actually catch a sheep. And you realize, I, I saw some videos on the internet how it's used. Is that if a lamb is, is trying to get away and you need to actually maybe steer it back to his mother, you can just simply hook it around its neck and, and gently, it doesn't hurt the animal, but you can guide it using that hook. It's like a little wooden lasso, right? There's a lot of value in a shepherd's rod. It can be used as a weapon, if necessary, to defend off, uh, defend yourself from wild beasts and so forth. And God says to Moses, what's that in your hand? He says, well, it's just a tool of my trade. And God says, well, hang on to that. I can use that. Hang on to that. Going down to verse... Three, it says, cast it to the ground. So he cast it to the ground and it became a serpent. <laughs> it became a serpent and it says, Moses fled from it. <laughs> I find that quite funny. I think I would get along with Moses because I would have done the same. I hate snakes. But this stick, it becomes a serpent and Moses is freaked out and he jumps out of the way of it. And in verse 4 it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and he caught it. And he became a rod in his hand. He says, God says, That they may believe that the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. This is a sign you can tell the people in Israel and the people in Egypt to know that you are sent by God. You can use your rod. God equips Moses with a few other little, you might say, tricks up his sleeve. He says, hey, put your hand into your cloak. And he pulls his hand out, and it's covered in leprosy. And he says, now stick it back in. And it comes out, and it's, it's whole again. It's, it's healed. And God says, you can also take some water from the river and take it away from the river, and you'll pour it, and it'll turn to blood. And these are a few of the signs to, 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 give, to empower him, to show him that that God was on his side, that God was backing his story. So God equips Moses, but still Moses is doubting. He's full of excuses. And jumping down to verse 10, and it says, And then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, and I am not eloquent, neither there, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I have trouble speaking. Now, some people think that maybe Moses had a speech impediment. But I think Moses is probably making the excuse that, hey, I haven't been in Egypt for 40 years. I haven't spoken the native tongue of the Egyptians for 40 years. And you expect me to go and try and reason with them? I've, I'm a little dusty. I'm a little rusty on my Egyptian, God. And God, he's so patient. Yet he gets a little frustrated with him. And in verse 11 it says, So the Lord said to him, who, was made, who has made your, a man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. But he said, Lord, please, send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Is there anyone else, God? Please, not me. <laughs> please, not me. Is there anyone else? And in verse 14, it says, So the aim of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is coming out of, to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put your words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with, the mouth, with his mouth, and I will teach you uh, in what you shall do. So God says, All right, listen. If you don't want to talk, all right, Aaron, your brother, he's good at talking. We'll let him talk. So every excuse, God meets, the, <laughs> he reaches out and he says, and he, he answers the excuse and he solves the problem. 
Moses has no other reason, no other excuses. And in verse 18, actually, I don't want to miss this. In verse 17, it says, And you shall take this rod in your hand, which you shall do these signs. He says, Moses, don't forget. Don't forget that rod. You're going to need it. Take it with you. That rod, that shepherd's rod, your previous skills that you've used before, I'm going to need those here with you in the future. And in verse 18, it says, So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said to him, Please, let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro says to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are now dead. It says, Then Moses took his wife and his sons, and he set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Now notice this. It says, And Moses took the what? It says, The rod of God in his hand. Now isn't it fascinating? I said before that everyone has received some sort of gift, some sort of skill, some sort of ability that can be used for the glory of God. And Moses was full of excuses. He says, no, I can't go. And God says, hey, what's that in your hand? He says, it's just a shepherd's rod. He says, I can use that. I can use that. The tool of your trade. Yeah, I can use that. Those skills of your trade. I can use that. And now Moses is now being sent on the mission. And that rod, that shepherd's rod, has now become the rod of God. That God has now transitioned his, you might say, his ordinary skills and ability. And he is now going to use them in a very powerful and, and wonderful way by the ordaining of God. It's no longer just an ordinary rod. It's the rod of God. So Moses sets out on this mission to call the children of Israel out of Egypt. And in verse 21, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put into your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I've met a lot of people that have actually wrestled with this particular verse. It says that God will harden the heart of Pharaoh. It kind of appears as though Pharaoh had no choice in the matter. That God was just some tyrant from behind the scenes manipulating people's characters, their thoughts and their abilities and so forth. And that Pharaoh had no choice. That he was just going to harden his heart. Let's keep reading. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? You know, to every action that comes to us, to any situation that comes our way, we usually have two options on how we can respond to that situation. At least two. We can respond to that situation positively, or we can respond to that situation how? Negatively, right? There's at least two options. When, when some pressure comes our way, we can respond either positively or we can respond negatively. Now, I used to drive a logging truck back in Canada. And some pressures that I felt when I was driving a logging truck was every morning when I'd head up the mountainside to pick up a load of logs. Now, going up the mountain, that was the easy part, usually. But coming down the mountain was the scary part. I kid you not, every morning coming down off the mountainside, my heart rate would go up, I'd be sweating, I'd be scared because of what was about to take place. Because almost on every one of our logging roads, we had what was called switchbacks. Do you guys know what a switchback is? Now, it's when the road is so steep that they can't go straight up the hill. They've got to cut into the hillside. And that's fine for a while, but eventually you can only go so far on that way up the hill, and you've got to switch back and go the other way. Now, those switchbacks are usually very short, but they're also very steep. And can you imagine? You're driving a vehicle that's now 25 meters long, you're coming down the mountainside, and sometimes it's slippery, sometimes it's icy. And you've got to go around this very steep switchback. I remember one particular time I was coming down this road, and it, it, I just started driving, and I was scared to, out of my wits. And I was coming down this hillside thinking I'm going to die at any moment. And I'm coming down, I'm about to meet the switchback, and in my wisdom and limited experience, I thought, well, I need to hang out as wide as I can in this switchback so that I can make it around it. And that sounds good, and that sounds nice. But it's, I got about three-quarters of the way around this very steep switchback, 
And all of a sudden, all that weight that was still hanging up from my load up the hillside was beginning to push me to the outside of the switchback. In other words, off the edge, which is my truck would not have fared very well if I went off the edge of the switchback, okay? Probably about a 40 to 50 meter drop. And so I'm kind of freaking out a little bit because I, I can't steer. I've got the steering wheel hard around and I'm getting pushed out off the edge of this switchback. I managed to actually stop. Now, I'm under a little bit of pressure. Can you understand at this moment? A little bit of pressure. Now, <clears throat> I'm starting to get some, uh, some assaults over the radio of like, man, why did, you, why did you do that? You're all hung up on the switchback now. You stopped people from being able to go up the road or down the road. And they're kind of yelling at me on the radio. So I'm experiencing, again, some more pressures. Now, I have an option here. How am I going to respond to this situation? Do you understand? I can respond negatively. and I can say, well, it was the road builder's fault. They shouldn't have made the road like this. You understand? And I can start blaming and casting blame that it's his fault. And then I can get quite angry. And I can throw it back in their face. Or I can say, well, what can I learn from this? One, I probably should have started my, tunes, my turn sooner. And that's what you actually have to do on a switchback. It feels totally wrong, but you've got to dive your truck into the steepest part of that corner and just hang on for dear life. And you somehow make it around this switchback. So I was able to say, you know what? Yeah, I messed up, but I can learn from this. And I choose to respond positively. And the next time, I didn't get hung up on the switchback. You're right. So... All of what I'm trying to say there is that we have a choice, and when we're experiencing pressure, we can choose to respond negatively, or we can choose to respond positively. And God was about to turn up the heat on Pharaoh in Egypt, right? He was going to try and get the children, him to let the children of Israel go from Egypt. And so there was a few ways he was going to turn up the heat, turn up the pressure on Pharaoh. But how did Pharaoh respond? And that's my question. Turn with me in your Bibles over to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8, God sends a plague of frogs. And it was gross. Frogs are everywhere. They're getting into everything. And Pharaoh says, fine, you can let, let the children go. You can go. And so God then allows all the frogs to die, and they gather them into heaps, and the, the land is filled with stench, the Bible says. And in Exodus chapter 8, and in verse 15, it says, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, it says that he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Now, in Exodus chapter 4, it says that God would harden his heart. But here the Bible is saying that it was actually Pharaoh that hardened his heart. In other words, God turned up the pressure, but Pharaoh had a choice. Was he going to submit to God or was he going to harden his heart and choose to respond negatively? It wasn't God manipulating Pharaoh's heart, but it was Pharaoh making the ultimate choice. Does that make sense? Go to the end of that chapter in verse 32. It says again, after there was a swarm of flies and the flies were, um, uh, they went away, God sent them away. And it says in verse 32, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. And again, in chapter 9, there was a, a hailstorm, there was lightning, there was thundering. And at the end of that chapter, in verse um, 34, the Bible says, And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, and he, was, he and his servants. In every case, it was not God that hardened or manipulated the attitude and the affairs, uh, the thoughts of Pharaoh. But in every case, it was Pharaoh making the choice, responding to the pressure in that moment. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm putting you to sleep. I'm sorry. All right. Let's go back to our story in uh, Exodus chapter 4. So God is sending uh, Moses to go and speak to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And in verse... Um, 22, it says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Now, why would God say it in this type of language? Hey, Israel, that's my firstborn, that's my son, that's my child, that's my baby. You need to let Israel go. 
You see, in those days, the pharaohs, they thought they were the son of the sun god, Amun-Ra. And so, they, yeah, they thought they were the son of a god and that they had special power and they should be retreated as such that with special authority and so forth. So God is speaking in the same language that Pharaoh would understand. Yeah, you think you're treated nice by your God, but these are my children. These are my babies. You need to treat them with that kind of respect as you want to be treated <laughs> by your God. So God says to him, let my firstborn, let my child go. And in verse 23, so it says, So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, and indeed I will kill your son, your firstborn. It was the final blow that if all the other plagues, all the other pressures that Pharaoh had chosen not to, to regard them, to not to listen to God's promptings, that finally the last straw, he says, all right, this is the big gun, Moses. Only use it at, last, at the last resource that Pharaoh's firstborn son would die. And unfortunately, that's what it took because sometimes as humans, we're, we're very stubborn. And sometimes we don't want to submit to the God of heaven. And uh, sometimes it takes tragedy to get our attention. I just wish we could learn our lesson sooner. Amen? Amen. So Moses heads out on this humongous task in verse 24, and it says, And it came to pass on the way. So that's, that's on the road, on the way there. It says... That at the encampment, so there was some sort of inn, there was some sort of hotel along the road on the way to Egypt that Moses and his family stop. And they're at this hotel room. They're in this inn. And what takes place? It says, Then the Lord met him and sought to kill him. What? I thought Moses was submitting to what God had asked him to do. And here, he's in a hotel room. He's on, out to, to fulfill this great mission. And God's standing there in a position as though he's about to strike him dead. What? I thought I was doing your will, God. The close reading of the text here, we can understand what the underlying issue is. The very next verse, it says, Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then he said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Friends, Moses was living in open disobedience to God's um, requirements in his own home. He was about to, to engage in one of the greatest tasks that probably any human has ever undertook, to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And yet there was something that was left undone in his home. The requirements of God, he was pushing aside. He was picking and choosing what he should do and what he shouldn't do. And he had failed to perform the rite of circumcision in, uh, on, his, uh, on his youngest son. Now in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, um, Ellen White states this. Now Ellen White is one of the founding members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is what she comments on this very situation here of Moses about to be killed by God in this hotel room. She says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 255, says, He, that is Moses, had neglected to perform the rite of circumcision upon their youngest son. He had failed to comply with the condition by which his child could be entitled to the blessings of God's covenant with Israel. And such a neglect on the part of their chosen leader could not but lessen the force of the divine precepts upon the people. In other words, if Moses was calling people to faithfulness, to obedience to God, yet in his own home he was neglecting these same truths, wouldn't that be presenting somewhat of a double standard? Wouldn't that be, what, what would we call an individual like that? A hypocrite, right? It would lessen the power of his message. In other words, God met Moses in that hotel room and he said, listen, Moses, it's either now or never. Are you on my side? Are you all in? Are you going to live for me? Are you really going to do this task? All of it, even in your own home, Moses. Are you in or are you out? Friends, I believe God expects us to live up to the truths that we teach. Amen? 
to live up to those wonderful truths that we read, that when we read the Bible, we shouldn't think, oh, that should apply to them, or, oh, oh I, know, I know where this would fit really good in someone else's life, but we need to apply it first to ourselves before we can share it with others. God expects us to live up to the truths that we teach. And friends, I believe God means what he says. And I think there's a question that I need to ask myself is one, am I living in some open or neglect, uh, sorry, some open or secret neglect of God's truth in my life? Am I living up in my home? First, look at me. Look at yourselves. How am I living up to the known truth in my life? Am I living up to the light that I know thus far in my life? I believe God is calling us to walk in the light as he is in the light, to live up to the truth that we know. In John chapter 12, turn with me there to illustrate this point. John chapter 12, verse 35. John 12, verse 35. Jesus says here, John 12, 35. And Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Pretty simple truth here. Walk in the light. To walk in the light, that means to, to keep up with it, to move with it, to live up to what is taught you so far. You know, sometimes when I study the Bible with people, uh, I need to remember this one simple fact, is that sometimes you want them to kind of to learn and to grow and to move along quickly, Yeah? That would be nice. But I need to be as patient with them as God has been patient with me. That yes, I'm 27 years old now, and it's taken God 27 years to bring me to this point in my life. And I believe I need to be that patient with those people as well that it may take them 27 years too. You understand? That we need to be patient with people. But I believe as individuals that we need to live up to the light that we know now. There's a, a valley in Canada called the Strine Valley. It's a beautiful place. If you ever have the chance to go in, Brit in British Columbia, it's called the Strine Valley. And you can go on a hike there. It's into the way, the back blocks, the bush of Canada. Now, it's a very grueling hike. And every time I've done this hike, I always think on the way in, why am I doing this? Because it's so painfully difficult is that you go up about 3,000 feet of elevation gain in a period of about one and a half kilometers, okay? So you're just like going up, 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 up. And finally, you get onto a plateau up there, and there's this rustic old trapper, trapper's cabin that's over 100 years old. And it's a really quite neat and, and sp uh, special, almost magical place that uh, there's a beautiful crystal clear stream running through the valley, valley that you can go and drink out of, and it's just sweet, pure water. There's beautiful, large uh, spruce and pine trees standing there. There's this huge boulder field that has caves, and, and there's actually a rock there that's got these ancient native uh, petroglyphs of old uh, like graffiti from 100 years ago. It's quite cool. Anyway, so I remember one particular camp out. I was 15 years old, and we'd hiked the long, grueling trail up to the Strine Cabin. But uh, the weather had turned south, and all of a sudden, while we were up there, it dumped snow upon us because we are at a 3,000 foot elevation gain. And uh, so we wake up the next morning to about that much snow on the ground, about six, eight inches of snow. And so we don't let it dampen our spirits for the day, so we set out on hikes, and we have a great time in the snow. And we're going this way and that way. We're going up. We saw a, a, a lake way in the back uh, end of the valley. But anyways, at the end of the day, we're all kind of cold, tired, and wet, and we're thinking, you know what? I don't wanna, we don't want to stay another night up here. Let's go home. But it was beginning to become dark, and so the leader of the camping group says, how many of you have flashlights or, or, or torches? And uh, out of the 15 or so of us, maybe six of us had flashlights. And we're like, oh, okay, we got about a four to five kilometer hike out, and it's getting dark, and only five or six of us have flashlights. So we uh, find out very quickly who has a flashlight. I did. And all of a sudden, you've got a bunch of buddies around you because they want to see where you're going, right? Now, those people that don't have flashlights, they have two options. One, 
they can stay in darkness and they can stumble around and fall, yeah? Or they can keep up with the light, right? That they can walk with the light and they'll be able to see where they're going. See, God, God has given us some truths in Scripture, friends, that He has placed upon each of our hearts. That He is calling us to walk in the light, to keep up with it, to, to live up to the truth that we know now. Not what we're going to know in the future, but what God has shown you now. And that's all that we are held accountable to, is what we know now. Live up to the light that we know now. We can either walk in the light, or we can stumble around in darkness, and nobody likes doing that. We've stubbed our toe in the darkness. We've banged our, our shin in the darkness. And walking in the darkness, it can look simply like disregarding God, and using our God-given abilities, rather for His glory, but for our own glory. Using them for our own uh, self-pleasure, our own self-gain. Rather than, than blooming into the plant that God has desired us to be. To know our true potential as a servant of God. Using our abilities and skills for His glory and honor. My little girl, she's one years old. And she's, not, she's asleep right now, that's good. I've put her to sleep. Um, you know, at nighttime, my, my wife usually sits with her, and we have our nightly ritual. I go, and I'll, I'll have a little good night uh, prayer and so forth with my son, and my wife sits with our daughter. But sometimes the, revol- re- the, the roles are reversed, and sometimes I'll have to go, and I'll sit with my daughter. And when I'm saying good night to her, you know, she's happy to say good night, and she'll lay down. But my wife will sometimes, she'll kind of rub her back to kind of soothe her to help her fall asleep. You guys remember that as a child where mom would kind of rub the back of your head or your back and just kind of felt good and you'd fall asleep? Well, this is what my wife does to our baby girl. Now, I try and do the same thing, but she's used to mom, okay, at this moment. And I'll try to rub my little girl's back to try and soothe her to help her fall asleep in my, my awkward, manly hands. And she knows right away that it's not me. And she'll... I kid you not, she'll grab my hand and she'll pick it up off herself and she'll set it aside. <laughs> Dad, I'm good. I don't, I don't need your hand right now. And I think this is kind of funny, so I'll do it again and I'll kind of rub her back and she'll pick it up and she'll set it aside. She says, Dad, I want you when I want it and on my terms, okay? It's more or less what she's saying. But it's funny, the very next day, she may see something that she wants that's out of her reach. And she has a very clever way of telling us what she wants. Is that she might see a a bicky or a cookie up on the counter, and it's out of her reach. And she'll hold out her hand, and she'll open and close her hand, open and close her hand, and she'll make a little squeak, and ah! That's what I, and she's telling us that's what she wants. Now, I love my daughter. I don't always give her what she wants. But I give her what she needs, you understand? I'm happy to give her what she needs. And no, I don't always give her what she wants at that moment. But she now is saying, Dad, I actually need your hand now. Right? I can't reach that thing. I need your hand now. I didn't need it before, but I need it now. And I wonder, how many times do we treat God like this? That I want things my way and on my terms. I want your hand when I think I need it, not when you think you should give it to me. I want things my way and on my terms. I want you as my Savior, but not as my Lord and King. I want to listen to your praises, but just don't ask me to sing. I'm happy to have your friendship, but I don't want your rulership. The Lord knows I need your grace, but don't ask me to seek your face. I want your name when it suits, but if it doesn't, I'll drop it and follow suit. I want things my way and on my terms. My child, he says, if it only were that easy, but your righteousness is simply too sleazy. I want to be your savior and to save you from yourself. I want to give you the keys of heaven And for you to experience my wealth. For this to be, I need to be your king. So I can save you and free you from your sin. Sin and self will always be a battle. If you're on your own. 
but let me be your ruler and I will guide you home. I invite you to take my yoke. Learn of me, for you are broke. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Give me a chance to end your selfish strife. Let me heal you. Let me fill you. Let me forgive you, for you are mine and you are precious in my sight. You want it your way and on your terms? I'm sorry. It cannot be, for I alone can set you free. So please, yes, receive me as your Savior. Also, let me be your friend. Stop your ceaseless roam. Let me be your ruler, and I will guide you home. Friends, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? I meet a lot of people, they like the idea of Jesus. They, they realize, yes, they are sinners, and they want Christ's saving grace, but they're not willing to accept Jesus also of their Lord as their Lord and Savior, as their ruler, as their king. In other words, they're happy to confess their sins and are happy to receive grace, but when it comes to the other portions of their life, their skills, their abilities, and their talents, they keep on carrying on using them for their own glory and self-gain. So my question for you, my question for me this morning is, is Jesus your Savior, but is He your Lord as well? I want you to look at yourself, because God says, what's that in your hand? And you might say, it's just a rod. I'm just a plumber, I'm just a builder, I'm just a machine operator. But God says, I can use that for my glory and honor if you're willing to submit your whole life to me. Is it your desire this morning, friend, for you to say to Jesus, yes, cover my sin, but also take my life. Live out your life within me and be fully surrendered to him and be used by him for his glory and honor. Is that your desire this morning? If it is, I invite you to sing our closing hymn right now, Live Out Your Life Within Me. O Jesus, King of Kings, be thou thyself the answer to all my questioning. <laughs>